Good morning. Welcome to Victoria's Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. Last week and this week, we have been studying the authority of God's Word. That means that we put God's Word in the highest priority, final authority, and last word in our lives. That means we live by God's Word as number one rule of our lives. And so as we've been studying the authority of God's Word, we are looking at what is the Word. And we saw that God is the word and Jesus is the word. We saw for the last couple days that the word of God is truth. It is the embodiment of truth. Now, today we want to talk about the word of God as seed, as seed. The word of God is seed. In first Peter one twenty three, it says being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we see here, it calls the word of God, the incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever. And incorruptible means imperishable, indestructible and everlasting. So the word of God is the incorruptible, imperishable, indestructible, everlasting seed of God. Hallelujah. Also in Mark chapter four, in verse three, Jesus tells a parable and says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Then in verse 14, he begins to interpret the parable and he said, the farmer sows the word. So he first said the farmer sows the seed and then he interpreted that by saying the farmer sows the word. So there again, we see Jesus called the word of God seed. It is seed. The word of God is the seed that made Mary pregnant. It was the seed that gave birth to Jesus. On Monday, we talked about Jesus is the word. And if you remember, we saw that from the very beginning, God began speaking the word of God, his word for Jesus, who became the living word. To come into the earth. He began speaking in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where he said to the serpent, This was after the fall of Adam and Eve when they fell into sin. And then God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, and upon your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. In verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. This scripture in Genesis 315 is the very first prophecy about Jesus Christ. And so what did God do when Adam and Eve sinned? What was God's solution? What was God's solution? What was his response, his reaction to the fall of man? It was to speak his word. And he began speaking his word into the earth because he knows that his word will never return void. His word will accomplish the purpose it was sent to do. And so he began speaking the word immediately. That was the first thing he did. He didn't spank anyone. He just spoke the word. Hallelujah. And then over the next 4,000 years, because it was 4,000 years from the time of Adam until the time of Jesus. And over those 4,000 years, God continued to speak. He spoke words into the earth through the prophets. He spoke through Isaiah. He spoke through David, Zechariah, and many other prophets in the Old Testament. 
And he was saying that there will be one coming. There is a savior. There is a Messiah. There is one who will come and he will be born of a virgin. And he prophesied for 4,000 years. Hallelujah. And then in Galatians chapter four, verse four, it says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. So in the fullness of time, you know, when a seed is planted, it takes time to grow and then it can be harvested. So God was planting the seed of his word from Genesis chapter three onward throughout the next 4,000 years. As he spoke through the prophets, he spoke words. These words were planted into the earth and they grew up in the earth until, as it says in Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time was come. What is that fullness of time? It's harvest time. Hallelujah. The fullness of time is the harvest time. And so in the harvest of time, The word of God was made flesh in John chapter one, verse 14. It says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. What word became flesh? It was all the words that God had spoken since the Garden of Eden. Since Genesis three throughout the whole Old Testament, through all the prophets, all of those words came to fullness, to fro- fruition and to harvest, producing in its harvest the life of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Hallelujah. And then it was that also that word of God that God spoke to Mary that made Mary pregnant, that caused her to conceive in her womb. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, and verses 26 to 35, here the angel Gabriel came to Mary. Luke 1, 26, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, this prophetic word that the angel spoke to Mary was the seed. God's word is the seed. As we read in first Peter, again, in first Peter one twenty three, the incorruptible seed, the word of God. So this incorruptible seed of the word of God was the, the word that angel, the angel spoke to Mary. And it was the very seed that was planted into her womb and caused her to conceive a child. Now, in verse 38, Luke 1, 38, Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. When she said, may it be to me. As you have said, at that very second, in that split moment, she 
accepted the word, she received the word, and so she conceived the word in her womb. When she said, "May it be to me as you have said," she was literally taking hold of the word of God as the seed of God and receiving it planted into her womb, and her faith fertilized it so that she conceived. When she added her faith to the word that was spoken, that word seed. Was fertilized, and she immediately had conceived in her womb. So she received the word. Now listen to that, because that is exactly what you and I need to do. Because the word of God is the seed for everything in life. The word of God is the seed for everything you need for life and godliness, as Peter also said. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's in the word, the word seed, but the word seed will never be activated in your life until you receive it, accept it, take it. And add your faith to it, and then when you receive the word, just like Mary s- received the word, and Mary said, "May it be to me as you have said." At that moment, that word seed was planted in her womb and became a living person, Jesus Christ. It con she conceived that in her womb, and. So, in the same way, you and I, we must accept, receive, believe the word of God as seed, accept it into our hearts, believe it, and let it be fertilized by our faith, so that it can also produce. And become flesh, as it says in John one fourteen, and the word was made flesh. The word became a physical thing. So, in the same way, the word of God will become a physical thing in your life when you receive it and accept it as seed. Let it grow and come to fullness, and in fullness of time, in the harvest time, you will see the word become flesh in your life. It will become whatever you need. It will become your healing. It will become your finances. It will become that home that you need, or that car, or that job, or that family. Whatever it is, it will become flesh. It will become manifested. It will become a natural reality. When you accept it in your heart, just like Mary did, just like Mary did, you also can say, "May it be to me as you have said." So she received the word because she was good ground, and then Jesus is the harvest of the seed. Jesus is the harvest of the seed of the word. Hallelujah. So the word of God should be the first seed that you plant for any need. If you need healing, plant in your heart the word of God concerning healing. Now, before I go on, let me say this again: the word of God is the seed that you must receive. For every need in your life, but if the word of God is the seed, then what is the ground? What is the ground for the seed to be planted in? The ground for the seed of the word of God is your heart. Your heart. Your heart is the ground, and. We can see in Mark chapter four there are different types of ground. Let's read Mark chapter four, verses fourteen through twenty. 
It says the farmer sows the word. That's the word of God. 15. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Verse 20. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 30, 60, or even a hundred times what was sown. Now, first of all, I want you to notice that only one out of four of those who heard produced a harvest. Only one out of four. That's only 25% of the hearers actually produce a harvest. And I believe Jesus is accurate. I believe he was telling us the truth. I believe he was teaching us something that is real when he showed us four different kinds of people who hear the word. So these are, he's not even talking about people who don't hear the word. He's only talking about those people who do hear the word. And then he shows us four different kinds of people who hear the word. And only one out of the four produced a harvest in his life. That means three out of four get no harvest. It's a sad thing, but that's probably the truth even today. Only three out of four Christians, perhaps, actually get a harvest from the word of God in their lives. Well, let's look at why. Because Jesus is telling us there are four different kinds of of people, four different kinds of people. And these people have four different kinds of ground. Now, what is the ground? Your heart, your heart. So let me ask you this. What kind of ground are you? Ask yourself that question. What kind of ground are you? Well, let's look at the four kinds. In verse 15, It says some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Now that path, it is hard ground so that the seed does not even enter in to the ground. It only lays on the surface and is immediately snatched away. So that ground is Hard ground, so hard that the word seed does not even enter it. Now, we were talking in the last couple days about having a hard heart. A hard heart does not even receive the word of God. A hard heart rejects the word. Don't be like that. As we said in Hebrews chapter three and chapter four, it says again and again and again, three or four times. Jesus said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So don't harden your heart, because if you harden your heart, you reject the word. It will not even enter into you and it will never then produce any kind of a harvest or crop in your life. So don't be the hard ground like the path because it immediately is snatched away. It does not even penetrate. Then in verse 16, it says other people are like seeds sown on rocky places. They hear the word 
and at once receive it with joy. Okay, there are people who hear the word of God and the first time they hear it, they say, yay, hallelujah, praise God, I like it. Verse 17, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So here we see people, they shout hallelujah. These are people who are going to say hallelujah, amen in church. But when they walk away, they do not allow it to take root in their lives. It says these people have no root. Now, what does it mean when it says they have no root? Or how do you get a root? How do you plant your roots in the word? Well, let's just take a second and turn over and look in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verses 47 to 49. And here we see Jesus telling another parable. And he said, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words. Okay, we're talking about people who hear the word, but they have no root. He said, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep, dug down deep. What is that? Roots, planting roots, who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. So we can relate that to the tree, the seed, putting down deep roots. And it said, when a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. Verse 49 But the one who hears my words, hears the word and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. What is that? Like a tree with no roots, without roots. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now, we had looked at this parable um, a, a week or two ago, and I showed you that a lot of people think that the rock is Jesus. And they, if you ask them about the what Jesus called the wise man who built his house on the rock and the foolish man who built his house on the sand or on the ground, what was the rock? And a lot of Christians say, well, the rock is Jesus. And they're thinking that Jesus is comparing people who are saved and born again with people who are not saved, that Jesus is the rock. And if you have Jesus in your life, then you're built on the rock. But if you don't have Jesus, then your life is built on the sand. And that would be all the sinners and unbelievers wrong. No, no, no. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. And then in verse 39, but the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like the man who built his house on the ground. So Jesus is not comparing sinners and Christians He's comparing two kinds of Christians. He's comparing two kinds of people that go to church on Sunday. So in your church on Sunday morning, you can look around you. And in all those people in the church, there are two kinds. There will be those who hear the word. They say, yes, amen, pastor. And then they go out and they put it in practice. And then there are the other kind that sit in church and say, yes, amen, pastor. And they go out and they do not put it into practice. They go out of the church and then they forget what they have heard. 
and they don't put it in practice, they don't act on it. So what does it mean to dig down roots? It means put the word into practice. It means every day apply the word of God to your life. Live by it from morning till night. You say, this is what the word says, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to practice it. I'm going to live by it. I'm going to apply it in my life. The doer of the word is the only one who gets results. Those who hear but do not do it will not get results. And they have no root, no foundation. And so when the storm blows by, they crash. I'm out of time. Let me announce to you that next week, on Friday, February 7, we will have our next Victoria's Faith Seminar at 7 p.m. at the Comfort Suites in the Denver Tech Center. The address is 7374 South Clinton Street. That's one block east of I-25 and one block north of Dry Creek. And we will have pre-service prayer from 615 to 645. So if you can come early, please do. Please come out and pray with us. Now, for more information about the seminar or for more information about the ministry or for Bible study helps, just go to our website, www.victoriousfaith.co. And remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.